First thing I want to say is that uh, I'm in a position called livestock stewardship, like it says on there, and so I consider the things I'm talking about this evening with antimicrobial usage and uh, how quickly and how good we do how good of a job we do on treating calves as a stewardship issue. So it it still falls within my uh, my uh, I guess expectations or objectives to talk about this topic. So let's begin. I, I'm going to start here and. And actually, I want to remind you, too, that every week, for those of you that have satellite radio in your truck, uh, I get to be on uh, Vets on Call on Wednesday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. I actually talked about some of these issues over the radio. Uh, now, you might think it's a difficult thing to talk about what cattle look like when they're sick, but actually, I think it's sometimes just as effective as if you were looking at the cattle. And so... That's kind of what we're doing tonight, but I do have a few pictures to follow along with it. So what does a pull look like? And by pull, I mean what are calves that are exhibiting signs and symptoms of being sick, what do they actually look like? Let's start right there. And, and you can see I took this picture. In fact, I didn't take this picture. Okay, Most of the time I'm on foot, so somebody else took this picture from the back of a horse. I have done it. In fact, for the back of a horse, it's sometimes a little bit easier to spot cattle that are sick just because, especially for me, you're just up a little bit higher, can see a little bit better. In cattle, much like in human beings, when we're sick and when cattle are sick, there's, all, there's a limited number of ways we can express that illness. And cattle are the same. So when we look at sick cattle, they may or may not have respiratory disease, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. They may be something, maybe something else entirely, but they kind of all look the same. One of the easiest things to get fooled on, especially in a feedlot environment or even in backgrounding environments, if you're feeding a lot of grain, is cattle that have acidosis where they've got a bellyache uh, because their pH of the rumen has dropped too low. Those cattle will look every bit like they've got respiratory disease, and you can't always distinguish the two, so you have to be a little bit more... Uh, a little bit more aware and a little bit more observant to, to figure out act exactly what's going on. That animal in the lower right-hand corner of that slide doesn't have acidosis, doesn't have respiratory disease. It actually had a bunch of lesions in the mouth, and so it didn't eat very well. It was not keeping up with its pen mates. So what does a pull look like? T entitled this feedlot cowboy BRD, which stands for bovine respiratory disease, what does it look like? The first thing that most of us will notice is that cattle will, we use the term depressed. I don't know if cattle are depressed or not. I don't know if they ever have a day when they can consider themselves to be depressed and need Prozac or something. But from our, with our human eyes, we, we use that term depressed because in many cases the headset is a little bit lower, the ears are drooped just a little bit, and they just don't look like they're feeling very well. Much the same as you and I would feel when we are dealing with the flu or some type of, of respiratory infection. Um, that's the first thing that we'll notice. We also might notice those calves lying down and not wanting to get up when, the, when their pen mates rise, or they might stand alone. More often than not, though, when we're, when we're out in the pen, one of the things that a, a calf will oftentimes do, especially if he's not familiar with us, he'll try and hide himself. And so they'll hide themselves and try and get behind other cattle so you can't see them. In some cases, I've even seen them go to the bunk, stand with their pen mates, and put their head in the bunk but not eat. And they're just trying simply to hide themselves. But that one of the things you'll notice with cattle that are sick is that they're not very full either. Okay, That anorexia or not wanting to eat is a pretty typical of these cattle. And that's sometimes in feedlots when the... the, the uh, guys driving the, the feed trucks are going by, they'll notice calves that are not up eating because when you drive the feed truck by, most of the cattle will come up to the bunk. The ones that are not feeling well won't. You might notice some more severe signs like knuckling or foot dragging. Uh, and, and sometimes that foot, you'll have to be really aware of what's going on there to see that. In dry pen conditions, you'll notice that calf dragging its foot a little bit and the dust will be kicked up. A normal healthy calf will pick its feet up and won't drag its feet. That's a sign that the calf's not feeling well. Maybe they're short of energy because they haven't eaten for a while, but, but they're just not feeling very well at all. And you can go all the way to do a calf that's down and won't get up, but surely we would have noticed something before that calf is down and can't get up. Another thing you might notice is nasal discharge. You know, a clear nasal discharge really 
is is fairly normal unless it's too much it might indicate that there's some upper respiratory tract irritation from either the trachea or from the nose itself uh, when it gets really colored when it's nice and thick and and either white or green we know we probably got some type of bacterial infection going on uh, so it may indicate something typically in the morning you'll see a nasal discharge if you got one in the afternoon, you probably think of something's going on that calf needs a little bit closer look. Coughing can be can be a sign. Um, uh, coughing is not always associated with lung issues or pneumonias. It's usually uh, in the upper respiratory tract is more of an irritation going on, so you'll hear coughing going on with some of those calves. Really, a soft, moist cough is more indicative of, of pneumonia rather than that loud, harsh barking sound that you might hear that's typically up in the upper respiratory tract. I've just got a couple of pictures of lungs here and, and I you wouldn't have known that unless I told you because I don't have the whole lung in sight but those are some really really bad lungs that we're looking at here. Well, the upper one's got some chronic uh, abscesses, it's got what we call consolidation that means that all the airways are covered up, those cattle can't move air at all. The bottom one's a little bit more indicative of what we might find in a BRSV, respiratory syncytial case, where the, the uh, spaces in the, in the, air, in the uh, lung are actually filled with fluid, and that animal can't move air at all very well. Okay? I, I throw this slide up here, and you should be on the slide that says BRD diagnosis. And because this, this slide relates to what we've just been talking about, when I look at the research surrounding our ability to find sick cattle, we're actually not very good at it. The research I've noticed, it tells us that we're maybe 60% good. So in other words, we find 60% and 40% of the ones that need to be pulled, we don't find. Now, I know there's huge variability in that. I know that there's some of you guys out there that can sense when a calf is just thinking about getting sick. And from my standpoint, that's, that's where I'd like to see all of us is that we have this almost sixth sense, we can look in the eye of a calf and we go, that calf's not feeling well. That's real, where we really need to be as good livestock uh, husbandry people. And so if you think you need to improve, and I told students today I was teaching animal behavior, I want them to be powerful, astute observers of animal behavior because an animal will tell you when it's not feeling well if you take the time and have powers of observation to find those sick cattle. So that's what this slide is all about. This one says that in this, in this group of calves, there were 35% that received treatment. However, 72% of all the calves had lung lesions at slaughter. Okay, So 68% of the calves that were never diagnosed or treated for respiratory disease had lung lesions at slaughter. So at least in this data set, that's not a good scorecard. We need to do better at that. And, and so take pride in finding those sick cattle, and you'll be rewarded because they'll respond much better. Driving into this area of therapy itself, and for, for all of us that treat cattle, we have to make sure that we don't do harm. Above all, do no harm, and that comes from, an, from a guy by the name of Hippocrates years and years and years ago. Let's not make the treatment worse than what we're trying to cure. And obviously, in the case of this calf looking at you, maybe he went through a squeeze shoot a little bit too fast, and and broke his nose. We don't want to do things like that. No matter what we're dealing with, we want to be able to say that we handle them carefully and they receive t treatment in a timely fashion. What we're looking for in antibiotics is one that works, one that's been approved by the FDA, one that has the label claimed to be used in beef cattle. Uh, we always want to think about beef quality assurance and preferably, at least for me, when I put together treatment schedules, I'm always concerned about volume. I want to use something I, I think that works, that is approved, but I always pick the one with low dose volume. I think there's less tissue damage. I think there's less pain involved with that. Antibiotics are chemical substances that were discovered back in the 40s, maybe late 30s, 40s, penicillin being the first one, and it was produced by a, actually a mold that grew this substance that inhibited bacterial growth, and that's where the, all of our antibiotics have come from. We've synthesized them. In later years, and we have a, I would say, a very good armamentarium of antibiotics to use these days. But they, they're chemical substances produced by organisms that suppress the growth of other organisms. And we need to make sure that we use them wisely 
and, and very carefully so that some of these products aren't taken away from them, from us, because they, we are under the microscope today in our use of antimicrobials. I give you this slide. This came from the Kansas State University Diagnostic Lab. And what this, got, this gives us, and I could have gone back a lot more years than this. This is just from 2009 to 2011, giving us an idea of percent resistant isolates. So in other words, in 2009, there was 55 isolates. This is for Mannheimia hemolytica, the main bacterial pathogen that uh, usually causes death in these feeder cattle and, and feedlots. 155 in 2010 and 2011, there's 179 isolates. Doesn't seem like a whole lot, but these were the ones that the diagnostic lab um, had submitted to them and for which they looked at were the isolates resistant or not. And all that means is that in the presence of this antibiotic, did the bacteria grow or didn't they grow? Did the, did the antibiotic inhibit the growth of that bacteria in, a, in, a, in the lab? Okay? And so what it looks like to, to me is that over time, maybe there's a few more resistant organisms. Let's just look at oxytetracycline, which would be our LA200s, basically, or noromycin. 56% resistant in 2009 or 81% resistant in 2011. Tilmycosin, you've seen that same pattern. In fact, all of these drugs kind of have the same pattern. Now, this tells us something. Okay, It tells us that these isolates perhaps are getting more resistant, but it doesn't tell you the whole story because most of the time these cultures are from dead animals, which is, means that you already have a biased culture. And these dead animals were most likely treated, so they've already been exposed to the antibiotic. So it, it, it's not a, what we tend to see, it doesn't correlate very well with treatment response or treatment success, which is probably a good thing because if it did, we'd be in trouble, okay? Most of the time when you and I use one of the, the better antibiotics on the market today and we treat an animal with a bacterial infection for respiratory disease, those animals get better. They really do. And so that's a good thing. But it also is a reminder, if you go back to this slide, that we need to be careful about when we use them and how we use them so to preserve their effectiveness for as long as it, it, we can. Now, will almost all antibiotics go through this? Yeah, they will. Over time with use, they will uh, build up more resistant organisms. So what about treatment response? How do we measure treatment response? And I just put this, there's a couple slides here, just a list of things that it just reminds us is not always the antibiotic. It's where the cattle came from. How long were they in the system before they came to my place? In other words, you know, what did they come from Mississippi and did they, were they shipped 1,500 miles and it took a week to put them together and and all those things. See, all of these things add to whether an, we think an antibiotic is going to work or not. What kind of pathogens are we dealing with? What's our processing program? What kind of nutrition and tender loving care did those cattle get on arrival? And are we careful not to spread some of these pathogens from pen to pen? I don't know that we've done a good enough job of that. Do we put, do we put new cattle next to new cattle next to new cattle? It's not a good idea because you tend to, if I could use the term fire, we tend to keep throwing fuel on the fire when we do that. So we need to think about where we put new cattle if we're buying new cattle every week or every other week. <clears throat> Immune status makes a difference on these cattle. The stage of the disease, and I put in here crew attitude and capability. This goes back to finding these sick cattle. Are we good at it or are we, have we got novices out there that don't know what a sick calf really is? And is the attitude of the person pulling the cattle in the right place or is he worried about health insurance? Is he worried about if his girlfriend is still his girlfriend? I mean, you know, it seems silly to talk about those things, but those things are really critically important when we're trying to evaluate treatment and response. So what am I looking at in terms of what, I, what response that I think is tells me whether something's working or not? The first one's important for me. Did the fever actually go down? We, we a lot of times have cutoff values for when we're going to treat a calf or not. Mine for years had been if a calf is 103 and a half or greater and I've pulled him because I thought he was still uh, not feeling well, I'm going to treat that calf. In truth, I will tell you that if I have a calf that I thought was sick and I pulled him and he had 102 and a half, I'm probably going to treat him anyway. Okay, I may have missed that calf. See, I don't know where in the course of the disease he really was. 
So it's nice to have these cutoffs, but in practical terms, we don't always follow them because we're a little bit worried we may have missed them and, and we still want to put some antibiotic in that calf. But 103 and a half, some guys use 104. So did his temperature come down or not? What's his attitude? Did those ears come back up? Has he started to eat again? Has he started drinking water? I mean, that's really the most important barometer of whether a treatment is, is successful or not. And we can use a lot of other parameters as well. <laughs> did the calf end up dying? Or did he respond somewhat and now it's a chronic? Uh, did I have to retreat him again? And retreat for me means I've had to retreat that calf within the time frame for which that antibiotic should still be working. So let's say I'm giving him an antibiotic that gives me a treatment for seven days. But on day five, I've got a calf that I know I treated, and he still doesn't look very good, and I'm going to treat him again. That's a retreat. Now, a repull is a little bit different. I don't want to get bogged down in the terminology here, but a repull for me is a calf that's maybe two weeks away from that first treatment. That's a repull. It may, in, in any case, both of these may have gone back to the home pen, but now I've got a calf that's outside that window of, of that therapeutic level for that antibiotic, and I had to repull them. Okay, that's not always a good sign either, I'll, I will tell you. And then treatment cost, you know, what's that cost of that treatment? It doesn't, doesn't really have anything to do with response. It might. It might if we're using LA-200 and really should be using something that is a little bit more effective. I took this from, this is from 1996, and I contributed to this book as well as Bob Smith, but, and these were really high-risk cattle, but, he says response rates in the same yard using the same treatments range from 55 to 86 percent. The reason I tell you this, and he says it's not due to antibiotic failure, it's because of the factors we talked about earlier. Where did the cattle come from? What age were they? What quality were they? Were they, were they the twos and threes that were bought one at a time, or were they bigger groups? It's, it's usually not the antibiotic that's failing. It's, it's something else there that's um, not resulting in the treatment response that you're looking for. This first bullet point here on therapy, this is some calves that I was familiar with when I used to work a lot with the stalker calves. Average weight, 552 pounds, multiple southeastern origin, multiple sale binds and order buyers. Most of you out in the audience tonight don't have calves that will reach this level of risk. But in this group, it was 50, we pulled 52% of them to treat them one time. With 3.1% mortality and 5.9% case fatality rate. <clears throat> the case fatality rate, all that means is that if I pull 100 calves, pull and treat 100 calves, and uh, six of them don't make it, that's a 6% case fatality rate. Okay, and, and I'll use that number to kind of gauge whether I'm doing pretty good or not. So what I've done below there, I've looked, I've just given this example of northern calves, which is what we have. And they're bawling, which means they haven't been waned, and they're commingled with other calves. I'm hoping I can stay below 15% morbidity, in other words, sick ones. I'm, I'm sure hoping I can stay less than 1% mortality, dead ones. And I'm hoping I can stay 5% or less on case fatality rate. So those are the, my expectations for therapy. If you're not there, you see, need to figure out what's, what's happened here. Is it my antibiotic that's not working? Probably not. There's something else that's not working quite right, quite right within the system. What about the cost of illness? Just going to make two comments on this. <clears throat> this is a study we did a number of years ago in which we looked at vaccinated calves versus non-vaccinated calves, and they went to the Decatur County Feed Yard in, in Oberlin, Kansas. And what I did, I took that whole data set and I looked at calves. It didn't matter which treatment group they were from in terms of vaccination. But I wanted to look at all those calves that had been pulled at least one time versus calves that had never been pulled or diagnosed and treated, okay? So I told you earlier that we could miss some in that whole process, but that's, that's all I had to go on here. Calves that had never been treated versus those that had been treated one time. And you can see there's a different number of head there, obviously, because not all those calves got sick. The average daily gain, this is from when they came in at about 600 pounds till they went out at about 1,200 pounds. It may have been just short a little bit. There's a four-tenths of a pound difference per head per day. That's huge. I mean, this cost of illness is huge. It's not just the treatment costs, which have gone up considerably, but the performance loss on those calves can be considerably if we don't find them quickly. 
What I've done here, and I don't know if I'm going to take the time to explain this a little bit, but when I worked in the stock or calf industry, I would try and calculate the cost of illness. And I should have visited with Tim about this ahead of time so he could correct my mistakes here. But what I try and think about is that if I've got illness in a group of calves and it exceeds a certain percentage or it's a certain percentage, how much cost of that has to be assumed by every calf in the pen, okay? That, that's actually of more interest to me. So this is how I did it. I took a 10% sickness rate, and I used here a value of gain. And, and, and while all that is is determining the value of going from, let's say, 600 pounds to 800 pounds, for every pound I put on, what's the value? Okay, that's what that value of gain is all about. And I've used 90 cents. I, I think I'm fairly close in there. And then I've used that 0.4 pounds per head per day, loss of performance, and then and for 90 days on feed. That's $3.24. And you can see I've used a $30 treatment cost, pretty high, but I did it to kind of serve my purposes here. I've used the processing cost because most of the time on our processing costs, it's geared toward preventing respiratory disease. And I've included morbidity in there and, and chronics and, and uh, dead ones. And so in my scenario here of 10%, 10% uh, sick ones, and this results in a half a percent death loss, a half a percent chronics. Every calf in that pen or in that group has to assume $23.89. I, I think that's a good way to think about it, okay? And so can I do things that can reduce that cost every calf? Well, if I give every calf an expensive antibiotic on arrival, <laughs> it's kind of a break-even, Okay. And I've just done something a little different here. How much would a 600-pound animal need to be discounted to make up this cost? And I just used that $23.89 divided by that six weight. You'd have to discount that animal four cents. So this, what this does, it allows you to say, okay, I've got this group of calves. I know a little history on them. I've, I'm putting three groups together. Maybe I can't pay a dollar sixty-nine or seventy. Maybe can I get them bought for four cents back? to make up for some of that uh, cost of that illness. Uh, just a couple slides left here. And all I've done here, I'm not, comp I'm not recommending an antibiotic here. I'm just telling you that when the bottom line comes, most of these antibiotics actually do a tremendous job. And it's usually not the antibiotic. Yeah, there are some numerical differences here. But if we find those animals quickly, we do our job on tender loving care and the right nutrition and low stress handling, most of those antibiotics are going to be in about the same level in terms of response. Remind you that uh, these are prescription antibiotics. If you use any other drug or use drugs off label, it's an extra level drug use and you have to have that valid veterinary client patient relationship. I'm not going to talk about combination therapies. I hope none of you do it. It adds way too much cost. You don't get any different response. I think this is basically the last slide, Carl, and I just want to leave, them, leave you with this. I, I think for those producers in the audience that background calves or feed calves, and we do it every year, you ought to go into your veterinarian, and I, I'm not going to get veterinarians in trouble for this at all. I think they'll delight if you'd come in there and say, you know, Doc, I want you to provide me a treatment schedule. I don't want to just run in and say, well, give me a bottle of this or give me a bottle of that, and, and I tell you i got respiratory disease. I want you to outline what I should use, what the dose is, if I should repeat it, what's the, the route of administration and withdrawal time. I think the veterinarians in this state would be happy to do th this for you, okay? So I, I think this is what you need so that there's no questions. If you're gone for the weekend and your brother-in-law or somebody's doing the chores for you and needs to treat cattle, he just goes to the, the treatment schedule and he says, this is what I'm supposed to do. It, it takes a lot of the air and a lot of the wrong dosing and all that sort of thing going on. So I think this is important in terms of antibiotic usage, and I, I think I'll just end with that. Uh, this is the last slide, and I, I, one of the things I didn't talk about, I didn't think it really had time for it, but that's... Sometimes we'll use antibiotics on arrival for those really high-risk calves, but I just chose not to go in that direction this evening. 